I am a principal software engineer here at Snowflake, and I'm going to talk about Sandshell. Uh, and I think uh, I'm not sure if you can make comments in the comments field, but if you can, like, let me know. Uh, the more interactive, the better. Although mostly, I think I'm going to talk to the screen for a little while, so I'll do my best to make it interesting and fun along the way. Um, so I, I want to start sort of with you know who who am I and why should you care? So. I took some photos that you might have bumbled across uh, of me across the internet, so they might look a little familiar. Uh, I have uh, started out life as a musician. I did not intend to do this computer thing, uh, both singing in choirs and playing the bassoon. Uh, and that kind of, I burned out on all that and decided, well, maybe I'll go, go do the computer thing. Video games were kind of fun. You know, maybe I can figure out how to run computers. Uh, and um, that led to a life as a system administrator for several years, running internet service providers and generally bumbling around uh, with uh, having having fun trying to, to break into systems, break them, and generally then fix them after they were broken. Uh, and so in the process, I ended up with this really excellent and amazing opportunity I stumbled into to go work for Google back in uh, about 2005. And uh, bonus points if you're curious about the image in the bottom left there, probably, I guess it's your left, uh, of uh, that was from sort of the, my intro to Google uh, which was a, a whole separate crazy story for another day. But the uh, outcome of that was I spent the next 15 years or so at Google learning to be a software engineer and learning how to scale up systems and finding that wonderful synergy between the running of large systems and the securing of large systems. You, you can't have reliability uh, if your systems are insecure. And if they're insecure, no one cares if they're reliable. Uh, so like I always found myself at the intersection of those two things. And that led to me contributing to the Building Secure and Reliable Systems book. I wrote a couple chapters for that, along with some wonderful and fantastic colleagues who get more of the credit uh, and deserve more of the credit than, uh, than I do. Uh, but I, I did enjoy uh, getting to put some of those ideas out there into the public world that we spent so many years at Google working on. In particular, the uh, ideas around insider risk and how we manage uh, sort of nation state attackers who were supremely interested in compromising the user data there, uh, a problem we worry about as well at Snowflake 2 now, like we have uh, this wonderful corpus of our customers' data that is super valuable to them. We want to keep it as safe as possible. And so we're bringing those same skills to bear. And in the process, one of the things I really wanted to do when leaving Google and coming to Snowflake was continue that same basic work uh, and be able to externalize some of it as well, sort of do some of that development and, and advance the best practices out in the open. Uh, and so that's essentially, th this is the first time where that uh, wonderful ambition has, has met reality. So I'm super excited to be getting out in the world and talking about uh, the, the work we've done here. Um, so I think it helps to think about why would you need this? If you have this infrastructure, the ideal infrastructure, everything I'm about to say is probably useless to you. Uh, my father was a physicist, so I like to say this is like, if you have spherical surfaces of uniform density, sort of the classic spherical cow, then uh, like, yeah, none of this is gonna matter. Um, but in reality, we almost never have things that are uh, automatic releases from head, you know, from, from main on each commit, uh, via push on green, like that is that is not the reality most of us live in. Uh, it usually looks something more like this. And if you're not familiar with these two particular meme images, congratulations on being one of, as XKCD would say, one of today's 10,000. Uh, the image here on the left comes from uh, Krasim and their uh, talk on microservices. It is a delight if you haven't seen it. And the right is just the classic meme of, of a whiteboard of complexity. I started to make my own like, ah, infrastructure is complicated. And then I realized these communicate it way better. And I think the essence of, of what I'm trying to communicate here is that your infrastructure is probably not entirely immutable. You probably have some pets in the corner that you hand maintain. And even if that's not true, if you have perfectly uh, homogenous infrastructure, sometimes at scale, problems will occur that you can only investigate on production, in production. You will have to reach in and figure out well, when this one in a million thing happens, it's only going to happen on that machine. I can't reproduce it in test. I need to pull that machine aside and, and poke at it a little bit, collect some data off of it, run some debugging information, uh, and, and be able to be able to, to tease out the problem. And of course, even if you you were to have the perfect debugging infrastructure and you always had the data you needed, sometimes bad things are going to happen to your infrastructure, meaning that there's going to be some 
shell shock uh, or uh, heart bleed uh, that will require you to react very quickly uh, to, to uh, apply updates to your infrastructure in a way that might be less structured than you normally would. Some of us experienced this with Log4j as recently as like a couple months ago. Um, even more interestingly, uh, if you don't know what that attack is uh, and you actually end up with someone loosing your infrastructure, you'll have to be able to respond very tactically uh, in the moment. And the typical solution for that uh, is something like SSH, some sort of interactive session uh, that you ultimately want to get onto the machine, debug it, understand what's gone wrong, or, or tracing back up the stack a little bit, even just apply the sort of rollout procedure or the, the point modification to the pet in the corner, your Terraform Enterprise machine that you know applies changes to your network, maybe you just hand maintain that thing, or maybe you were diligent and set it up from first principles, but it broke in some way you couldn't foresee and you need to preserve that state file. These kinds of things come up in the running of real infrastructure on a fairly frequent basis, but they undermine in a real way the best practices we would like to apply of not uh, perturbing the machines in ways that we cannot audit or understand in advance well. Uh, so what are our sort of options for, for these kinds of dealing with real systems? Uh, and this is by no means uh, a comprehensive survey of the available solutions that you could apply to these problems, but it's the ones that came up in our discussion internally at Snowflake when we were talking about how do we manage our systems and how do we, we improve them over time. The obvious one, of course, is OpenSSH. It's the default that everybody starts with and falls back to baked into almost every Linux distribution you encounter. Uh, Teleport, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, from a company called Gravitational. It is uh, in some ways, more elegant and more um, uh, managed solution to these kinds of problems with a, a proxy layer, sort of some other sexy features on top of that as well. Uh, but fundamentally, it is a very similar uh, SSH-like transport uh, and can actually use SSH the transport layer, if I recall correctly. Um, Ansible is another sort of pattern people often use for, ah, I need to perturb this pet in this particular way or even just configure this machine in a particular way. It's still session focused. It, it usually uses OpenSSH as its actual transport layer. That's the typical pattern. Although you can run it locally, usually you SSH in to do that. Um, HashiCorp boundary is an interesting uh, sort of uh, option here. And I realize now looking at my slides, my alignment is a little bit off. It's also session focused. It's not pull based. That's more for Puppet and Chef. We'll come to in a second. Um, HashiCorp boundary offers some uh, features that you also find in gravitational teleport that allow you to um, go through a proxy or, or control access, uh, do session logging, be able to understand what ideally what happened over that session, take a complete log of it, uh, control access a little more dynamically, not on the machine, but at that proxy layer. But fundamentally, in most use cases of these systems, they're about, again, providing you interactive access to be able to have a shell on the machine and mutate it through time. Puppet and Chef occupy a slightly different space. They are generally speaking, non-interactive. Uh, like you write a config file uh, and then the local agent on the machine will pull down that configuration file and understand the intent you wrote into the config and try and make the machine match the intent. You can do that, of course, in a, a I wanna run this command. The, command, the intent is please run this command and you can pull it down. But that pull model has a bit of a, a, a disconnect between when you make the change in sort of the master server and when it's applied to the far end. Uh, so it's a little less deterministic, a little less uh, carefully controlled. And you end up having to build orchestration layers in order to overcome that. Um, they're totally viable solutions to these. In fact, all of the things on this slide are excellent solutions to not quite the problem that we were trying to solve. Uh, and I tried to sort of capture that in a, a way of understanding how they fit together. And forgive my sort of first pass at this Venn diagram, but you can sort of see that on the right-hand side, you have those things from the top of the slide, the, the pushed-based solutions, OpenSSH, Teleport, Ansible, and Boundary that sort of lean on, on those ideas. Uh, and then, uh, but all of those are interactive. They don't fit in the non-interactive category. And then you have the sort of non-interactive aspects of Puppet and Chef, and they also give you a thing you don't tend to get from that pushed-based uh, infrastructure like OpenSSH or Teleport. You, you do, with Puppet and Chef, get granular action uh, to control the authorization. So I want to run this particular command. Well, you can check that into version control, have it go out, and you can see that just that exact command you intended to run was going to happen, but you 
don't necessarily get to do that in a, in a well-controlled way. It's sort of going to happen when the machine checks in and updates its config. So none of, none of these solutions quite occupy that uh, star in the middle. I want to add one, oh, well, one thing while I'm thinking about it. This really highlighted to me when I made this slide. We don't have a good logo for Sandshell yet. If you know somebody who makes good logos, let me know. That's a thing that I want to put the logo there. Um, so another testament to how early we are in this process and conversation about Sandshell. Like we, we haven't even got a logo yet. It's kind of fun. Um, the other thing here is that um, I want to acknowledge that these solutions that are, are on the slide, um, you can mutate the normal usage and be a little off the, the beaten path for how you use them and get some different properties here. As an example, uh, I mentioned with Ansible, you can uh, use it in an, a non-interactive fashion locally on the machine. Like you could put OpenSSH together and Ansible together, and you could build tooling that would allow you with force command in OpenSSH to only be able to call a certain Ansible playbook with a certain set of args. You can build these tools together in a way to achieve more like the solution that gets you closer to that star in the center. Uh, and I didn't want to say that wasn't possible. Like I want to uh, clearly acknowledge that uh, teleport uh, and gravitational writ large is actually building solutions into this space that offer uh, clever solutions I'll come back to to some of these problems about it being interactive, but being able to understand what happened after the fact. Uh, they still just aren't quite what we wanted and I'm also willing to hear feedback from, from your group or others that there are ways to chain these things together to achieve that star in the center, that, that idea we were aiming for. If you can do it, I'd love to know more about it. And I wonder if there are synergies of how we can put these tools together uh, and make even better things as we go. But that said, when we surveyed the landscape, we didn't really find quite what we wanted. Uh, and so some people will say, why do you care about this non-interactive part that is the key sort of driver behind Sandshell. And I think it's because of what I call the auditing arms race. And the idea here is that if you want to observe what happened to production, that many people will say you can sort of take a log of the session or you can look for the commands that were run uh, and you can tell that everything was safe if you don't see anything unexpected. And I think that is, uh, that is what I call an arms race, because if you let me have access to an interactive shell on your computer and talk to the Linux kernel API, I promise you, I can do things you didn't think of that will let me persist access to that machine or do things that I was not supposed to do. Uh, I've often uh, joked with some of my peers in the security community that if you find the right developer and you just shake them a little bit, a Linux kernel API vulnerability will fall out. Uh, we had tremendous, uh, I don't, I don't want to say luck. Luck isn't really quite the right word. Success, I'll say, uh, with kernel API fuzzing uh, at Google. Uh, and we observed that like, when you fuzz a new area of the kernel, that you will find interesting problems. And you can dig into those and find even more related problems. And the kernel API is so large that as you wander across the kernel, by the time you've sort of painted the Golden Gate Bridge and come back around to the same spot again, there are new, there's enough code change in that space uh, that there will be new vulnerabilities by the time you get back. So uh, in this context, what you're trying to do when auditing an interactive session is ensure that you understood all the things that happened and that nothing outside your visibility uh, snuck through, right? Uh, and th that access to production was, was safe uh, and you have confidence that your user's data was not in any way harmed. That's a thing that I fundamentally believe is impossible uh, because of this arms race. Everything you can think of to watch, someone will find some way around it. And so I, although we do, uh, and there are many people doing an excellent job of this. And again, props to Gravitational Teleport. They're making it easy to install an eBPF filter that follows exec calls. Like that's, that's a very clever way of doing it. It's a thing we consider too, and we actually use internally at Snowflake to monitor the, uh, the activity on the machine that might be hard to see by auditing the session, but you can sort of see it happen at the kernel API. Even that is imperfect. Uh, we want to get to a state where like, there is no interactive access, that everything is well understood up front. You can review it up front, uh, and then you can have confidence when you audit it later, you get a clear, small, simple, predefined set of things that uh, allow you to understand what happened to that machine in real time. So. That's where we ended up building Sandshell. It is a non-interactive remote inspection and management of hosts. Uh, and it was made because 
uh, we, we couldn't find a better way to achieve those pr uh, primitives from, from the previous set of things we were thinking about. Uh, and we also recognize we won't be able to think of all the things we need to do in the future. So we made it incredibly modular along the way so that we can plug and play the pieces of this building block itself. So sand shell is not a final solution to any of the problems I've sort of talked about. Uh, it, it is, you are able to use it to do individual simple things to a single machine, but you cannot necessarily control a rollout progressively across a set of machines. You need additional tooling on top of sand shell. Uh, it is intended just to be one piece in a larger infrastructure puzzle. Uh, and you may see, and I can't say about future plans from Snowflake just yet, but there's some conversations going on with the, the lawyers and some wheels that are turning so we can maybe release more of those building blocks that we're using uh, into the open source community in the coming months and quarters. And I'm really excited to talk about that later when I can. But for now, know that this is just one piece of those building blocks. And I still think even by itself, it's super useful for the... Uh, ability to do this understanding of the machine and mutating it through time in a very well-controlled way. So what exactly am I talking about? Describe like very high level concepts, but let's start to get into the nitty gritty. So Sandshell is really just a gRPC server. Uh, and if you're not familiar with gRPC, you can think of it like a, a REST API where uh, with, with a slightly bit more control over versions through time, that instead of passing JSON, as would be typical via uh, REST RPC, it passes protocol buffers, which is a, a Google devised and open source solution to wire format of how you pass data around. It, it's um, it's reasonably well, uh, I, I imagine probably everybody here is familiar with gRPC. Uh, if you've played with Kubernetes, it's also behind the scenes there as well. Um, so we have two pieces here that we're going to talk about. The SAN SH, which is the, the client that talks to the server, and the SAN shell server itself. Uh, in the client, there are two broad categories of things. There's the raw commands and the convenience commands. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second, but the raw commands are basically like, I just want to talk to the, the basic interface exposed by SAN shell server. Uh, and the convenience commands are... Yeah, I want to do something slightly friendlier. I want to do this series of things, and I want to do it in one command, one shot. It can bundle those things together and make a series of requests and responses and give you back the, the data you actually wanted without having to do it piecemeal. So this raw API, what, what's it made of? Uh, well, it's made of modules, and you can see them there at the bottom of the diagram, sort of the local file and exec. And we'll talk in more details about those. But the key takeaway I want to impress upon you about Shen Shell modules is you should write some uh, in the sense that they are uh, made to be easy to write. Uh, they're typically 30 to 40 lines, and they allow you to express, this is the thing I want to do to the machine at a high level and give arguments, just like you would with a function call, that are the, um, the incoming request protocol buffer in that gRPC request. And you can then pass that to a function in your program in Sandshell Server. Uh, and voila, you can do that to the local machine. And the reason why you should want to do that is because then you can write OPA policies about it. OPA is the open policy agent. Uh, there is a, a language called Rego, which allows you to write quite flexible policies that say, if you pass this argument with this value, it is accepted. And if you don't, then it is rejected. Uh, and that is a fairly straightforward way to take the complex idea of I want to run this command and be able to write it simply in a policy like you can only run that command and not another thing. Uh, so let's take a closer look at exactly, well, actually, we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I mentioned you might have the raw inconvenience commands. Imagine you want to do uh, like uh, collect a set of debugging information from the machine. You want to get a list of the processes running. You want to get a list of the files in temp or Etsy, and you want to sort of bundle up your application state and, and export it back out. Then that might be three or four of these individual module commands. Uh, and you might want to write a convenience command that is like san sh this machine debug dump. And whatever that might be for your infrastructure, you can easily write that as a, uh, a san sh client command. Uh, and then you don't have to in interact with the three or four things, and you can rapidly do that one bulk operation and let the, the client and server communicate to derive that package for you on the back end. So uh, 
You might wonder, of course, I've talked about things like executing commands and otherwise like reading files off the machine. Gee, that seems like it might be a remote uh, uh, privilege escalation vector. H how do you secure this thing? Uh, so the short answer is MTLS. Uh, and I like to think that's probably the right answer in many infrastructures. If you already have uh, a client and server infrastructure for issuing um, uh, a, a, a CA, I should say, for issuing certs to your clients and to your servers, then you're kind of off to the races. If you can uh, pass in an argument to an X509 cert on both sides, you're done. Uh, and in fact, there's an easy way to generate those in the templates uh, that ship with Sandshell. So if you don't have one handy and you just want to tinker around with it, there's a test command you can run that will create them on your local client and make it very easy to set up and run. I also understand that most large infrastructures will already have some solution to authentication and authorization, authentication in particular. And maybe you're using Spiffy and Spire, uh, maybe you're using Okta, maybe you have your own internal solution. Uh, there's uh, the... <laughs> There are, there are many, like every large infrastructure I've ever been uh, exposed to has, has solved some variation on this problem. Uh, and that's why we made it pluggable. Obviously, you don't want to have to, to, to bring in a new authentication authorization infrastructure for, for Sandshell. You want to sort of be able to write the one that works in your infrastructure. We tested this for our own use case because we have uh, an internal authentication authorization infrastructure we're piggybacking on as well. In fact, we have the old one and the new one, which is pretty typical for a large infrastructure. So we've actually done a couple of these pluggable things already. Uh, and I think that it should be very easy and flexible enough to cover pretty much anything you could throw at it. But maybe not. Maybe you've got some exciting, interesting way of uh, authentication, uh, authenticating between your endpoints. And if so, I would love to make it adaptable enough to cover your use case as well. So we'll, we'll come back to this later. Like send us pull requests, talk to me, uh, grab me on, on LinkedIn or wherever else, and we'll, we'll be glad to figure out how to make this adaptable enough for whatever authentication infrastructure you can throw at it. The one sort of mind-bending case I've seen of this already, I have a friend who works at Tailscale, a former uh, Googler, and we were talking about, well, could he use Sandshell within Tailscale, either within their infrastructure or as part of the product, maybe? Uh, and he mentioned that, uh, like, they already have authentication solved. Like, that's the whole point of Tailscale, is that they do that at the network layer. So he's, can I just rip it all out? And we're like, huh, I don't know. I don't actually think that would be easy, um, but we should make it possible. And it, it is... We're a thing we're already looking at, like how can we even make no off a thing you could choose to do, which seems crazy, uh, but in certain circumstances might actually be the right choice. So uh, I mentioned earlier that we'd get into a little more detail about like what the uh, the policies look like and how you might, uh, once you've authenticated to the daemon, then you got to figure out, is it okay to do these things? Uh, and so I included a sample policy here. Uh, and this is sort of uh, a few different stanzas that describe the, the most basic kind of thing you might want to do. Uh, one of the modules is called Health Check, and it's just literally like uh, sort of like an ICMP uh, echo request and echo reply. It doesn't take any arguments. It doesn't return any data. It just says OK. Uh, it literally doesn't return a gRPC error. And in this case, the input type there you can see is healthcheck.empty, which is the type of message that is uh, being sent. And it is allowed by default. Uh, and this is, uh, default is a bit of a stretch allowed by this policy. And this is roughly the policy that ships in the default repository. Uh, but you really should never run the default policy. You should, you should, of course, want to change that for your infrastructure. I'll talk more later about how to do that. But in short, um, you can see a couple examples here of, uh, I want to be able to read a file, but only this file name, Etsy hosts. Or I want to be able to uh, execute a command, but only this specific command. Like I want to run echo with the arguments, hello world. It is entirely possible for you to abuse this interface. You could uh, make the command be a regex match in Rego and allow any command to be run. Uh, it is possible for you to try to write complicated regular expressions that will allow good commands and not allow bad commands. It's a powerful foot gun. Don't shoot yourself with it. Uh, but it should be flexible enough to allow just about anything you want. One of the things we want in the future, uh, and this is a peek towards the, the future roadmap, is to allow multi-party authorization and multi-party approval so that when you run this command, you might allow general um, dot star access, if you will, to uh, exec request, allow any command to be run 
but only with approval from another authenticated identity, from a peer in your uh, engineering group, for example. And in that way, you can allow sort of emergency response for things you didn't think of and put into policy. Sometimes these policies can be hard to mutate, and we'll come back to that a little more later too, especially if you have a lot of uh, hosts in your infrastructure, then you may have many thousands or hundreds of thousands of these policy files, and it's not, in my opinion, uh, safe or responsible to update those in, and converge them all in a matter of minutes. That would be a little, a little likely in the edge case to, to cause an outage. Uh, and so you might want to have that policy lever in place in advance rather than try to mutate the policies in the moment when you think of it. We actually have a, a, a fix in our back pocket for that idea I'll come back to. Uh, so a little bit more about what these uh, actual modules do. So let's take a look at exec. I mentioned some of them are like 30, 40 lines. The, the Go code that backs this up is very small, very readable. Uh, and feel free to, to go poke at it. By the way, um, I should include a link to the, uh, the GitHub repository. Some of these slides are, are going to get to be a little bit of an eye chart in a moment. So, uh, Yuli, if you've got the, um, uh, the link, feel free to drop it in the comments, or it's at uh, github.com slash snowflake-labs slash sandshell. Ah, and look at that, right on time. Thank you so much. Um, the example here is how do you run arbitrary command on the remote machine? Uh, and it, it's fairly readable to me in the sense that there's one RPC. Uh, it's called run. It takes an execution request, and it returns an execution response. Uh, just like uh, argv and argc, you give it a command, and you give it a repeated string of args. Uh, and it gives you back the byte strings of standard out, standard error, and it gives you a return code. It's extremely straightforward. Uh, and you can imagine that that is, of course, one of the most flexible interfaces, and you could implement anything you want to with it. As an example, you could cat Etsy hosts, and it would come out in standard out, and you would be able to uh, write a policy around that to say, I will allow you to run cat with the arg Etsy host, and you're, you're done. Um, that might not be the most flexible way to achieve what you actually want in the sense that, well, what if you want to write something bigger than Etsy host? It's going to all have to come back in one response. Uh, or what if you want to allow things that are owned, reading of files that are owned by certain users and not others, or more complicated policies would be very difficult to write with this interface. And so as a step up from that, you might want to implement something like the local file module. And these two examples, exec and local file, are part of the standard open source distribution. They're already written, they're already done. You can just use them right out of the gate, write a policy and be able to read and write files to your heart's content. Uh, or, or run arbitrary commands. You don't have to do this heavy lifting, but I'm walking you through the ideas of how you run execute and how you why you might want local file. So you can apply those ideas to whatever module that makes sense for your infrastructure. So in this case, the service local file contains at least read stat and sum. Um, two quick disclaimers. If you go look at the code in GitHub for this, there are more things implemented since I wrote this slide. Uh, and there uh, are <laughs> probably some slight changes to these interfaces since I wrote this slide. Hopefully, we will do our best to keep them backwards compatible. Uh, and even if we didn't, then as long as your server and client are versioned together, gRPC should help keep you from, from uh, having any confusion about what is or isn't supported by the server as it updates through time. That said, uh, here you can see read. I mentioned like catting Etsy host, and that was one of the things in our policy example from before. This would give you a much more reliable way to call a read request. And you can see it gives you the, uh, the file name, the offset and link. So if the file happened to be really large, something bigger than Etsy host, for example, then you might uh, be able to read that back in chunks uh, and not have to read the whole thing. Or if you want to implement tail and only read the end of the file, that would be entirely possible with this interface. You also see stat and sum there. In many cases, you'll want to be able to call uh, stat on a lot of files. And so you notice that's a streaming input request. You can send sort of a lot of file names inside that stat request and then get back a stream of replies. And the same for some. You might want to check some a lot of files so you could send in the stat, uh, uh, sorry, the sum, sum request with a repeated set of file names uh, and get back a repeated set of, of replies of checksums for that. If you want to, for example, understand whether the state of this directory is up to date on all the machines, you can go and sum them all in each directory and get back the list of sums. And then you could go and uh, stat the, the files and see if they've changed through time so you can avoid the overhead of summing them. And if you find a new one that shows up, then you don't need to read it off all the machines in which it's on because you know it's sum. 
you can then find where that file exists and you only have to pull one copy of it with read because you know the checksum of that file. So you can see how you could start to build much more complicated sort of intrusion detection ideas uh, or machine state verification ideas on top of this very low level interface. Uh, although you might imagine taking an even higher level idea like that and making it its own module so that you had a check the checks on this directory and return me a list of sums that could be a module that actually just calls the interior functions inside the local file API or, or realistically just call stat in a loop like it's pretty pretty cheap um, but you can compose these things in ways that are, are quite powerful so uh, I think we need to pivot at this point and talk about okay I'm gonna I, I just mentioned the idea of running across you know, thousands of machines potentially and looking at thousands of files. And if I have to do that from my laptop uh, to machines in production, that's a, that's a fairly kludgy way of going about it. I may not even have network visibility to those things. What are the solutions in this space? So we have this problem in our infrastructure, like developers do not have network line of sight to most machines in production, uh, generally good practice. Uh, and the we have a proxy layer that you have to go through to get there. And there's a set of like reasons. Network reachability was at the top of the list. But I mentioned earlier that if you have hundreds of thousands of hosts or more in your infrastructure, you can't really change the policy on all of those endpoints at the same time and converge them. So when you come up with, oh, we have this unusual case where we are seeing a crash one in a million times we run through this code path. Uh, it's occurred on these three machines. I need to get access to those three machines and run this unusual command to collect the debugging information. Well, you would have to, you can't predict which three machines it's going to happen on. So you'd have to push that policy to the, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of machines in your infrastructure. If instead you all, all your requests go through a, po a proxy and that proxy has a fairly blanket policy to the endpoints, you only have to change the policy on the proxy. And if you mess up, in worst case, you crash all the proxies when you feed them a bad config, you don't actually crash or have a runaway memory usage or anything on the endpoints that are actually serving production. You have your isolated proxy hosts, you can iterate them a lot more quickly and a lot more safely than you could iterate the entire fleet of, of sand shell servers. So having that interjection in the middle allows you to have a more rapid policy response uh, and to contain that policy change and distribute it quickly. Um, <laughs> yeah, lesions of sysops who dig into Go's stream struct. Yes, that's going to be uh, a, a super exciting thing. We'll, we'll, the stream part we'll get into in a minute. Like it is uh, the, the gRPC over gRPC is essentially how this is implemented, which is a wonderful uh, innovation by a good friend of mine, John Alley, uh, another snowflake. Uh, and it is, uh, it is a little mind bending, but it is super powerful. Uh, so the other thing here, of course, I mentioned, if you have lots and lots of these machines to touch, you don't want to have to make an individual TCP connection from your uh, your control point, your laptop, or your, your uh, automation point to all of the machines across the world. You may want a, a closer endpoint that you can fan out from. And the proxy serves uh, the job of doing that. You can pass this command or this module and its arguments on this list of hosts to the proxy, and it will manage the fan out, handle those TCP connections from the proxy to the endpoint, coalesce the results, and return them back. Uh, it also, uh, I think, is a great logging choke point and multi-party approval choke point so that if you want to know all the things the humans did and you only grant policy access to humans in the proxy, then you get one place to, to cleanly capture those logs. You don't have to collect them all off the end machines. You probably should, but it's, it's a little harder to build that logging pipeline as your infrastructure scales. Uh, and multi-party approval is an interesting uh, roadmap feature for the future when you want to say, I need to collect this debugging information or make this emergency change on 150 machines or 150,000 machines or 2 million machines, you don't want to have to issue a multi-party approval for each of those invocations. But it's totally reasonable to say, I want to issue a multi-party approval for this one RPC that's going to the proxy that lists 10,000 hosts. I review that once, I approve it, and then that allows the engineer who wanted to affect those 150,000 hosts to do so in a big scream and hurry in a way that's approved in advance, that's logged reliably, uh, that is a, uh, a single point to make that approval and then have everything downstream trust that point. So that's the sketchy part, right? This 
proxy becomes a very powerful role and the credential it has is exceedingly powerful if you use it in the way I just described. Uh, and it's also an extra dependency along the way. Like if you if you depend upon going through that proxy and it goes down, you lose your your control infrastructure, your 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 out of band error control API for that. So you may want to have another path. Uh, you may not want to use it at all. Uh, you may want to restrict what it can do in terms of that role. Maybe you don't offer it exec. Uh, maybe you don't offer it. Um, things that you uh, want to constrain even more carefully. Uh, and that's a thing I actually uh, neglected to talk about before. Um, that is uh, an aspect of the, the way all of Sandshell is designed. Uh, and this is a good, as good a place as any to mention it. Um, it is designed in the sort of classic C++ philosophy of you do not pay for what you do not use. Uh, and that, in that, but I mean that from a reliability perspective, a code complexity perspective, and a security perspective. Uh, every module has to be explicitly imported in the main statement of Sandshell server. So if you do not import the exec module, the code will not compile into your binary, and there is absolutely zero risk that anyone would ever write an exec policy stanza that would allow remote code execution on your machine. So if you want to have a more constrained set of modules or a different authorization structure, you can literally pull out the pieces of the, the code very easily that you don't want or don't trust and only include the things that are appropriate for your infrastructure. We use that in building the proxy. It incorporates some of those same modules that are incorporated in Sandshell Sand server, and it doesn't incorporate some others that don't make sense. Uh, and in building your own instance of Sandshell, which is re really the best way to do it, not to use the stock version, but to create a small fork, uh, of that library and modify the Sandshell server binary to include the modules you want from your repository, exclude the ones you don't want from the open source repository, and end up with your tailored build artifact, maybe with your tailored authentication authorization story for you. Maybe you have something other than OPA and Rego. Maybe you want to use uh, internally at Google, there's a system called RPC security policy. Uh, that looks a lot like Rego. Like I imagine were they to use this uh, at Google, that they would write their own module for that policy language, and then they would be able to use a standard policy expression uh, across the way. I'm certain other infrastructures would have uh, a, a similar way of, of skinning that cat. But like the, the big point there is, if you use the proxy, it's super powerful, um, but you can contain that, contain that in a way that's appropriate for your infrastructure. So let's try and put this whole big picture together. Uh, you've got your user on the left side of our slide here. Uh, they have a CLI that allows them to have a bunch of modules that make it easy to do all the things on the right side of the graph. But ultimately, that devolves down into a client connection. Makes a secure MTLS connection to probably the proxy server, where you get to evaluate the OPA policy against what the user is trying to do. Maybe you fan out. Maybe you talk only to one server. Uh, maybe you reject the policy entirely. Uh, but if it succeeds the policy check, then that passes through that same uh, MTLS uh, authentication on the other side uh, to the gRPC server on the far end. That will be the Sandshell server. Uh, and that gets another OPA policy evaluation, again, with the credential of the proxy at that point, not the credential of the user, although the user's identity is passed through for logging. Uh, and then it gets into one of those three or, or however many modules that are uh, invoked, assuming that it passes the policy check uh, and your policy uh, your, your module then does whatever it's going to do, uses the local host API, uh, and all the data flows backwards through that chain all the way back to the user. Uh, I think that's pretty much the big picture for Sandshell. Um, I think I'm on to my thank you slide. So I want to pause and say, although I'm the talking head that's telling you about all this, there was a tremendous amount of humans effort, different humans, that went into making this possible. Uh, and that includes, if you look at the contributors list in GitHub, uh, my really good friends, John Alley and James Chacon, as well as uh, other snowflakes that contributed along the way uh, would not have been possible without them. I'll give a special call out to Harpreet Dillon, who I don't think is actually listed in the public repository, but did a ton of work internally. Uh, this has been a really wonderful collaboration inside working on this. Even beyond engineering, there were, uh, I heard Greg Tchaikovsky mentioned earlier by the, uh, in the Polish introduction, uh, his support was invaluable in getting this out the door and in terms of uh, discussions with the, the legal teams and the policy teams and the patent teams, making things happen at a, a, a large company is, is 
uh, often challenging, but in this case, it was really a delight to work with all these wonderful players and be able to bring this idea out into the light of day and advocate for it and give you the tools to take it and run with it and implement it. Uh, so I hope that this is something that is as exciting to you as it is to me. Uh, and I hope people find ways to use these tools in their infrastructure to make them both more secure and more reliable, more auditable, more predictable, and generally more of a delight to operate and deal with on a daily basis. And if you sleep better at night as a result of it, then like I I'll feel really happy about that. I think that's uh, pretty much all I've got to ramble on about. Um, I think we should probably pivot and ask if there are questions because I think that's one of the things I'm super interested about is this idea hits uh, sort of the open source community uh, from, from Warsaw to the Bay Area to Asia and beyond, like how, how it's received is super interesting to me. And I'm sure we will un uncover things I didn't think of when we get it in people's hands. Uh, and I, I look forward to, to seeing how that all comes together. Please. I'm really curious, uh, <clears throat> you, well, you published, you open source it, right, uh, Sasha? But what improvements, what feature, what uh, changes uh, are you most looking forward to? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mentioned in passing a couple times that we are talking about uh, multi-party approval. So I should give the big disclaimer, there is no multi-party approval support yet, um, but it's coming soon in the sense that uh, that's like the, the top of mind feature for us to implement. Uh, and uh, there are, uh, in the open source space, there, of course, the ability to think about other authentication and authorization mechanisms. I, I want to see uh, how, how those, uh, what people need in that space. Like, let us know if there are things that you, you want to be able to integrate with. Like I mentioned, uh, the idea of having no authentication, uh, is a, was a crazy one that sort of, uh, confused me initially. Like, oh, all right, there, there are cases where you actually just trust the network and that's good enough. Uh, so if there are other cases like that, that, that seem, uh, unimaginable to me, I would love to find those and put them on our roadmap, but, uh, multi-party approval and the ability to do uh, stronger audit logging out of the gate, uh, in encrypting those logs uh, in Sandshell before they're written down to disk is another interesting one. Uh, and I imagine we'll, we'll come up with more as we go. Those are the two at the top of the list, though, uh, and, and looking, looking for other interesting ones. 